Thank you for watching Forage Focus. My guest today is Clifton Martin, the Extension Educator for Agriculture and Natural Resources in Muskingum County, and I'm your host, Christine Gelly. Clifton, what are we going to talk about on Forage Focus today? Well, Christine, we're here staying in this hay field here in Southeast Ohio. It's hot. It's July. Uh, we've got a lot of plants and weeds around us, and a lot of these we have to be conscious of and, and be aware of how to control, so we're, we're here to discuss that today. All right, stay tuned for more details. All right, Clifton, so out here in the field, we wanted to talk with our viewers about some basic things to get to know your weeds. There's a lot of important factors that go into weed control in pastures and hay fields. What are some of the things that producers need to know when they're deciding what's a weed, what's not a weed, and how do I deal with it? Right, so th there's a handful of things we need to keep in mind. I think one of the things we just need to take a, a step back and look at is just the environmental conditions that we're, we're standing in and dealing with this year. Um, so, so number one, if you ask anybody right now, it's completely wet and, and we're record setting in our, our rainfall and conditions we've had to deal with. So that impacts some of the growth that we've seen. Right? So a lot of our spring and, and early summer growth has been very vigorous. Um, and we're, we're here in the middle of July and, and we're tailing out of that really vigorous growth. And typically when we get into this heat of the summer, we talk about the, the summer slump, uh, especially with our forward grasses. They're just, they're, they're not as productive, they're slowing down. Um, and, and we see that in other plants too. But one, of the, one thing that happens then is that with the grasses slowing down, other plants may not respond that way and they begin to grow very vigorously. Right, and we're gonna look at some examples for that today. But our, most of our pasture grasses that we use in Ohio are cool season they are. perennials. Yeah, cool season perennials. And, and we're always talking about uh, the fescues and the orchard grasses. Uh, uh, rye grasses, those sorts of grasses. Yeah. And those are the things that are going to start to taper off growth once we start getting average temps above 80, 85. Absolutely. And uh, those will go dormant and then we'll see lots of active growth from maybe less desirable plants in our pastures. So how does life cycle play into that? Well, so the, the life cycles of the plants are pretty important to understand. Uh, they help us make decisions about control, uh, whether we need to bother uh, mowing or what sprays we might use. And when we're talking life cycle, we're talking annuals, biannuals, perennials. Those are kind of the three groups that almost all plants just fall into. So in our annuals and our perennials, uh, biannuals, biannuals as well, these are all the, the categories that we place our plants into. They're important to understand for making some control decisions. Uh, an annual plant grows for a season and then it's done. It's kind of a, a one hit wonder. Usually they have lots of seed. Uh, and, and like I said, they germinate early. Uh, and, and by the time you get a frost, they're over. Uh, so, so biennials, they typically take two seasons to grow. Uh, and they're going to usually germinate in the fall and put on vegetative growth in the fall. And then they will put up a seed head and, and go through their reproductive stage in the spring. Uh, and that's actually particularly problemsome for some plants because they get established in the fall and then we're not aware they're there when fall is the best time actually to control it. And perennials do kind of the same thing. They, they can get started one season, um, and, and they typically last for more than two seasons, uh, but they may get started, and then we don't really uh, become fully aware to their presence until they're really well established. And again, in, in a more, more mature phase of, of their life cycle, it makes them hard to control. Right, so when you see the pasture that's behind us, there's lots of examples of different types of plants, different life cycles, different growth habits. And we'll see examples today of all of those plants, biennials, annuals, perennials. Uh, when growth habit is a consideration, what are the things that we're looking for to distinguish between classifications of weeds? Uh, we're looking for things, so, so just talking about plants in general, uh, we talk about grasses as a narrow leaf plant. We talk about a lot of our other weeds as broadleaf plants. So our uh, two main classifications of plants that we use a lot to, to begin talking about them are broadleaf and narrow leaf. And our grasses, like you're holding there in your hand, that's what we typically refer to as a narrow leaf plant. Um, broadleaf plants, 
very much what you see in the, in the landscape behind us, these taller plants with wider leaves. Uh, again, that's what we call the broadleaf plant. Many cases, uh, when we're looking at weeds in the, in the pasture, it's the broadleaves that we are trying to manage. Uh, however, there are some grasses uh, around that we, we do try to keep out. Uh, Johnson grass, for example, would be one throughout Ohio. Uh, that, that does give us some, some trouble. Foxtail is, is Fox one Foxtail, exactly. I yeah. know a lot of people in, in the away. pasture set, yeah. Uh, Foxtail is a grass weed, and one of the things that makes those grass weeds difficult to control in Ohio is because most of our pastures and hay fields are grass-based rather than legume-based. Uh, and when it comes down to using a broadleaf herbicide or a grass herbicide, if we choose to treat our grasses, we tend to have more damage on our desirable plants in a typical Ohio pasture than if we were trying to treat broadleaf plants in a grass pasture. So it can make those management decisions a little bit more difficult when your biggest problem is a grass weed. Absolutely, it's, it's similar with clovers. So if you have foxtail, you don't want to get rid of all the grasses. Uh, if you have other broadleaf weeds, typically producers are still trying to save their clovers. Uh, so there's always a little bit of a, a give and take there on and what we try to do with our pastures and how we manage them, especially if uh, herbicides get in the equation. Right. And reseeding is always an option, but you do need to be uh, concerned with what the reseeding restrictions are based on what herbicides you choose to use. Some of them have replanting restrictions where the herbicide may leave residue for a certain number of months uh, to prevent you from reseeding. But many of our common ones, you can frost seed clover back into the stand fairly easily. So once a manager realizes that they are struggling with a weed problem, what are some of the resources that they can use or consult to become more informed and make good decisions? Everybody should have a few resources on hand quick that they can refer to. Uh, and we, of course, keep a few of these in our office that we use. And Ohio State has its production or uh, its material. Uh, the Weed Control Guide, uh, they release this about every year. And there's a section in here that discusses pasture and forage weeds. Uh, and, and so having a good resource like this will help you determine herbicide use if you need to use it. Even mowing, it'll discuss the value of mowing as well and, and how to time that. So now that we've discussed some of the basics uh, for getting to know your weeds, we're going to take a walk and we're going to look at some examples for you here in the field, discuss what weeds we see, uh, how they are problematic for a manager, and some suggestions for how to control weeds like them. So we'll talk about this weed first. It's pretty obvious in this field. You just look around and you see it everywhere. Uh, ironweed. Very common. Very common weed here around Southeast Ohio. Important feature to know about ironweed is it's perennial, and, and one of the reasons why uh, that's important is because if you just mow it alone, uh, you're going to leave the root stock in the ground, and a new growth will continue to come out year after year from those roots. That would be a typical problem with perennial weeds. Uh, now, one of the first questions any manager should should ask themselves is, will mowing be sufficient for my weed management control? Uh, we we want to make sure we, we caution people not to just dive into an herbicide program right away because typically the, the expenses add up and you're, you're spending money uh, and, and of course we all need to make sure we manage that. So ironweed uh, and, and again herbicides are available I mean, and, and should be part of the program. Uh, many of our broadleaf herbicides would be sufficient for controlling it. It puts on a purple flower and right now those flowers really haven't fully developed but you can see that they're growing and, and getting ready to bloom. All right so the the next weed we'll take a look at here is horse nettle and horse nettle can take a couple different forms in the field you might see a white flower you might see a flower uh, with uh, with some purple in it. Uh, when you see that flower it'll be one of the good indicators that you have it. I've got it right here on the ground. Uh, again it's a broadleaf. Uh, compare it to the ironweed which was growing very tall uh, this horse nettle is, in this particular case, this plant's very low to the ground. Uh, so one of the issues here you might have with it, as you can see, we've got flowers here, and they're only six inches off the ground. Depending on your mowing height, how this plant is reproducing, you're not going to prevent it from going to seed if your mowing deck is above six inches. 
Uh, so that's a challenge with some of our weeds and, and why mowing doesn't always work because they can reproduce uh, below the height of the mowing deck. Uh, horse nettle again is a perennial. Uh, so again, those root stocks, the, the roots can remain in the ground and if you just mow it, it can continue to grow from those roots year after year. Uh, typically most uh, broadleaf herbicides are effective uh, and, and there's fairly reasonable control uh, opportunities for it. So we've just switched to a, another horse nettle plant here in the field. Uh, there's no flowers on this one. Two things that are different about it though are it's growing a little bit taller so mowing could be effective on this particular plant but we do have the berry here uh, and the berry is important because that berry can be poisonous to livestock. Uh, one of the other parts of this, it's called horse nettle and most of our nettles we know have thorns so yes this horse nettle, horse nettle does have a thorn. The next plant we'll talk about is broadleaf plantain and buckhorn plantain. Uh, Two different plantains, both very common. Buckhorn plantain is what I have here. Uh, it is a broadleaf. However, you might think if you were just walking through that that's a narrow leaf grass. Um, again, it, it's right here. It's difficult to see. There's a seed head back here. It's a broadleaf plant, very common. Very easy to control with herbicides if you need to. Uh, but really, there's a lot of leaf matter there that really can be uh, suitable in forage and hay. Uh, the biggest problem with buckhorn plantain or broadleaf plantain uh, would be in a new seeding where you don't get good uh, weed management early and it could crowd out grasses. Uh, probably a lawn situation is actually where that's a greater risk. Uh, most forage fields we're not terribly concerned about it but it is a very common plant to see. Alright next plant we'll talk about is cocklebur. We've got that right here uh, kind of this lighter green plant that's pushing out. Got a little bit of iron weed behind it and some uh, horse nettle right here. Uh, but cocklebur is going to be a summer annual uh, and so the, the reason that's going to be very important is management wise you want to avoid letting it go to seed and if you can avoid letting it go to seed you can help keep that stand reduced. Uh, mowing can be very effective on it in an early vegetative stage and we could probably consider that you know if you mowed it right now you probably get some fairly good control uh, and, and it's, it's typical of a lot of plants if it is allowed to get to that uh, reproductive phase where it has the burrs on it uh, animals are going to avoid it animals might eat it now but once it grows larger they're going to keep away of it because of those burrs and, and that won't be a tool for you then. As we're coming down the hillside in this field here we're starting to come into some of this this white flowering plant. Uh, this plant's in the parsnip family. It's very common. Uh, again uh, this would be Queen Anne's lace often called wild carrot. Uh, this might be another that you find along a roadside um, and Poison hemlock is going to be a plant that we distinguish from. They're very closely related. They have, both have white flowering uh, uh, seed heads on them. Uh, and again, so this is wild carrot or Queen Anne's lace. It's not poisonous. Where that poison hemlock is known to be poisonous, and that's why we make that distinction. Uh, it has very narrow leaves here, uh, and, and then the, the white flowers here. All right, we've, uh, again, Queen Anne's Lace here, uh, right next to ironweed and some, some clover here. Uh, we talked about Queen Anne's Lace being related to poison hemlock. Uh, they're both biennials, so a lot of the growth on those biennials happens in the fall. You might not really be aware that you have it until you, you start seeing this flower. In this particular case, you could probably mow this off, and, and you're going to cut these, uh, these flowers back, and that'll help you with some of your control. Um, but with those biennials, if you're thinking herbicide sprays, timing on that, like we said, is uh, you get that early vegetative growth in the fall. And that's typically the best time to be thinking about an herbicide control program. Uh, right here we have the famous multiflora rose. Uh, throughout Ohio, this now is one of our, our most famous weeds. Uh, and in this particular one, it's been, it's really chewed up by the Japanese beetles. But yeah, we find this a lot in our pasture fields. Uh, it would kind of fall in that category of a, a woody weed. Uh, sometimes it takes a little bit extra work to get the, the woody weeds managed. Uh, a lot of our, our broadleaf herbicides will work on it. Uh, most of our animals are, are going to graze around it and leave it. Uh, they're they're, they're going to leave them alone. You might find goats that will go after it. Um, but, but again, most of our, our beef livestock, they're going to avoid it. Uh, mowing alone, again, it's one of these plants that you can't just mow. Uh, whatever you leave behind, it'll, it'll allow new growth to come from what you leave behind. Uh, so you have to have kind of a multi-faceted uh, approach to it. 
it kind of brings up this issue of overgrazing and undergrazing. Uh, and, and a lot of our, and, and those are two situations we try to avoid. Uh, if you overgraze, it gives a lot of opportunities for a lot of poisonous weeds to, to develop and come in uh, because your, your forage stand just can't compete. Uh, and if you undergraze, your perennial weeds like your uh, multiflora rose, your, your ironweed, uh, they have more of an opportunity uh, to thrive and survive in that setting. Okay, this is very common. It's not a weed, but it is uh, that red clover, and we just thought we'd, we'd mention that quickly. Most experienced producers are, are certainly familiar with it. Uh, and one of the reasons we want to make sure we talk about it is when we, when we choose our, if we're going to use an herbicide program, uh, our clovers can be highly impacted. Uh, some, of the pro some of the clovers will grow back real quick, uh, but, but again, it's a broadleaf weed, and if you go out trying to hit ironweed or, or whatever it is that you're trying to control, uh, it's going to have an impact on those clovers. All right, we found the famous, very famous milkweed here, uh, and it's kind of one of our, our cultural conundrums here in agriculture. Of course, it's famous for its, uh, the role it plays in the monarch butterfly. It's also famous for the trouble it gives uh, pasture managers, particularly in hay, it doesn't dry down well in hay, and, and there's lots of conversations about whether or not it's toxic, uh, has toxicity to livestock. Um, but really, if it gets in that hay, uh, it, it can be, carry a lot of moisture, and it's, it's difficult to uh, store your hay in those conditions. Uh, it's reasonably easy to control. It's a perennial. Uh, again, it kind of turns into one of these uh, decisions you have to make as a manager. Uh, you, what are your priorities? Uh, because a lot of we hear all the time, let's save the milkweed, save the monarchs, right? Uh, well, as a manager, you might have to make some choices. Uh, you might choose to have a portion of the field that you manage if you're if, if it's something you'd like to, to see uh, around, uh, and then have those portions of the field where you try to keep it uh, keep it eliminated so that you can manage your hay uh, more specifically. Uh, again, it's uh, you know we got that story of the monarch butterfly, and we're all supporters of that. Uh, but it puts us into a little bit of a bind uh, when we find it in our fields because ultimately it's not beneficial for us or for the livestock. Clifton, throughout your talk today, you've shared a lot of wisdom with our viewers about weeds. We really appreciate you dedicating some time to this. And uh, before we leave our producers, what's some general advice that we can give them about weed control in general? Well, I think uh, number one is make sure you have some good res resources on hand. We talked about a few of the books, and so it's always good to have something that can help you identify the weeds. And then there's plenty of guides out there that discuss what are the appropriate herbicides to use, uh, what mowing practices you should use to help control weeds. I think one of the other important points we need to make is that really an herbicide program is, is kind of a last ditch effort. Uh, that whatever we can do before we get to an herbicide program usually saves us money. Uh, so when you get a stand established, as you make decisions about grazing, all of those impact what you might have to do later. And most people agree that they don't want to spray herbicides. I mean, we do it because we feel forced into it. Um, uh, you know, there's the cost. Sometimes there's kind of these social and cultural questions. And, and so we're always trying to navigate that territory. Um, and, and again, it's, it's the, whatever work you can do ahead of the problem saves you money and time later. Absolutely. Herbicide application is expensive. Brush hogging is expensive. Probably the least expensive investment that you can make is to spend more time getting to know your land, your livestock, and your situation. At any time, you can feel free to contact your county extension educator with questions about pasture management and weed control or Clifton and I at the contact information on the screen. Thank you for watching. Join us next time for another edition of Forage Focus.